the sun came up, I had had enough, and I was just like, I'll just engage till they kill me. He's out there on his own in the middle of nowhere. How is this possible that this guy could survive this? There's no way. I was at that waterfall when those guys walked on me, and then I fell. That's when Gulab came up behind me. Gulab was a guy who held Marcus and he saved his life. He didn't look like he was in very good situation. But he looked like he was going to die. I got this. I knew I, you know, I was supposed to help him. The right thing to do. He basically said, if you need help, then I will use my code of honor, Pashtun Wali. You will be adopted and protected by my village. Why you help me? Why do you help me? I didn't know that it was a tradition in that village, you know, if they invite you in, yeah. give you food, shelter, they'll, yeah. they'll fight they'll to the death. They'll yeah. you two minutes and they'll put a gun up and fight for you. That's it, man. What's that, Uno? He says that Taliban came to me at first and told me, hey, give us this soldier. We will go about our way once you hand him over. I told him, this is our culture that he's in my house now. I cannot turn him over to you. And to have this guy risk his life and his child's life and the women and children in his village, it's a much bigger, broader thing. All the things Marcus was talking about, discipline and code of honor and dedication, Gulab had all of these things. Who would have thought these two guys would be lucky enough to find each other? What would they have done to Marcus if you had given them to we, him? We know for sure they would kill him. There's only one reason why Marcus walked out of there, you know? To me, that just carries a lot of weight. Gula basically said, this is my village, and if I tell this man I will protect him, I will protect him, or I will die. Why are you doing this for Marcus? There's a lot of people out there that love people and want to help people and care. And I just found that so inspiring and gave me so much hope. Overtime editor Ann Silvio talks with CNN's Anderson Cooper. Anderson, your story this week is about a Navy SEAL named Marcus Luttrell. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't be alive without a man named Mohammed Gulab. Mohammed Gulab is a Pashtun villager who stumbled across Marcus Luttrell. Marcus Luttrell had been in this very intense firefight with three of his SEAL brothers. <laughs> they had gone into enemy territory to try to observe a uh, militia leader aligned with the Taliban. His three SEAL brothers were killed. Marcus was badly wounded and was confronted by this man, Mohammed Gulab, and who just happened upon him in the mountains. You went to Texas and spent time with both Gulab and Marcus. Did their bond seem genuine? Did you, could oh, you yeah. see the love between them? Yeah, them? I mean, it's, it's a, you know, it's a really interesting relationship. I mean, they don't speak the same language. Mohammed Gulab does not speak English. Is that you? <laughs> but they say they get each other. Yeah, they have this way to sort of communicate. What do you think of Marcus? He doesn't like me very much. <laughs> He's a good person. He's brought me twice to America. What do they do together? Did you get a sense for how they spend time together? Marcus has a beautiful ranch in Texas. They have a rifle range. So they shoot together? Yeah, they shoot together. And uh, yeah, we went shooting with him. This is Anderson Cooper's interview, so we're going to get Anderson Cooper shooting some guns. <laughs> you got to get up here and shoot too, cowboy. What was that like? It was really interesting. I mean, I'm, I'm not a very good shot, so it was to have Marcus Luttrell teach you, you know, um, how to handle a, uh, a sniper rifle. It's pretty cool. Boom, hit. Gulab uh, likes to use an AK-47. And a lot of what they do is just spend time together. They go for long periods of time without even necessarily saying something, just driving around together and just hanging out. Does he yeah. stay at Marcus's home? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He stays at the house. Yeah. It's a unique friendship yeah. that sort of spans cultures and, and words. So you speak in English to him, he speaks in Pashtun to you, and if you don't have a translator, you can still pretty yeah, much make absolutely. out what you're talking about. I mean, I understand enough of the language to when he's trying to communicate with me 
Uh, a, a lot of times I don't speak it back because I'm from Southeast Texas and it sounds just like total garbage when it comes out of my mouth. Uh, Your posturing is not too good. Yes, sir. No, it's it's not. You speak with a southern southern accent. So, yeah, um, South tune. So, South yeah. tune. Yeah. <laughs> they have a bond which is hard to imagine. They have been through something which is very difficult for anybody who has not been in combat, who has not been in that situation to really understand. In the five days that we were together, it shot us 20 to 30 years into the future after everything that we had been through together. I mean, it was serious out there. I mean, there's people dying every day and we were doing everything we could do to stay alive. And he didn't know me from anybody. He very well could have just left me laying there on the side of that waterfall and let me die, but he didn't. Marcus, he calls him his blood brother. Everyone likes you. Oh, yeah, so, so sweet. You. He was just an uh, Afghan villager. He's actually kind of one of the tribal leaders of his village, and they decided to help Marcus Luttrell. They'd never met him before. He was a complete stranger, but they have a, there's a Pashtun code called Pashtun Wali. It is a tribal code, code of honor that we have. Uh, somebody that comes to you, you must uh, help them if they are in need. Could you make sense of that? You know, it's a, it's a concept that's hard, certainly for, I think, anybody who's not in the Pashtun community to, to perhaps understand. I mean, it, this is a, a, a code of honor. It's something that I, I find hard to imagine. I mean, you know, we all like to think we would help somebody in need, but... But putting your kids' lives at risk. Right, Muhammad Gulab not only put his own life at risk, he put the lives of everybody, his entire village at risk, his, his children at risk, his wife at risk. According to Gulab, the Taliban came to him and said, you know, first offered him money, offered him all sorts of things if they would give up Marcus Luttrell, and he refused. This man saved my son. What's it like to, what was it like to meet Gulab? I hugged him. Mark told him, said, my mama's going to hug you, you might as well get ready for it. Because I was, I did, I couldn't help it. And they're different there, they don't show affection toward their females. So I just hug him anyway. He don't have any say over it. <laughs> He's my friend. Well, I love you. Muhammad Gulab just had this code of, of honor, Pashtun Wali, and, and lived up to it. One of the most extraordinary stories of bravery to emerge from the war in Afghanistan began when a four-man Navy SEAL team found themselves badly outnumbered in a long and vicious firefight. Only one of the SEALs survived. His name is Marcus Luttrell, and tonight you'll hear his account of a mission that went horribly wrong after he says his unit was surprised by, of all things, some goat herders and their goats. Marcus Luttrell's three SEAL teammates weren't the only American casualties in the battle. A chopper with 16 other Special Operations Forces that had rushed to help Luttrell and his team was shot out of the sky. Everyone on board was killed. At the time, in June 2005, it was the largest loss of life in one day for naval special warfare since World War II. A former commander of Marcus Luttrell's, retired Vice Admiral Joe McGuire, told us no SEAL will ever forget that terrible day. The story will continue in a moment. Was that the toughest day for you as a Special Forces commander? Yes. You know, most people of my generation, um, they asked the question, you know, do you remember when Kennedy was shot? Well, I remember that as well. But a much more moving day for me and one that's more defining is the 28th of June 2005 when that helicopter was shot down and three of my men were killed on the ground. Nineteen men lost their lives. Vice Admiral Joe McGuire was head of SEAL training at the time. You would have to go back to World War II to have had one day where we experienced that many casualties at one time. McGuire says the entire SEAL community was devastated. It's a community Marcus Luttrell and his twin brother decided they wanted to be part of when they were still teenagers. He had it in his head that he was, this is what we were going to do. He was like, it's going to be great, man. We get to jump out of airplanes, we can shoot guns, we blow stuff up, we get to scuba dive, and there's an 80% chance we're going to die. And I was like, well, sign me up, man. <laughs> Marcus Luttrell became a SEAL at the age of 25 and says receiving the special warfare insignia was the proudest accomplishment of his life. Do you remember when you got the Trident put on your chest? Absolutely. February 2nd, 2001. You remember the date? Like it was my birthday. 
Out of 86 people who started out in his SEAL training class, only 20 graduated. It's that sort of rigorous training that Vice Admiral McGuire says prepares SEALs for the kind of firefight Marcus Luttrell found himself facing in the mountains of northeastern Afghanistan. These are just, you know, unremarkable men who do absolutely remarkable things. Um, they're warriors. It's a warrior class. It's a warrior spirit. And they are extremely talented individuals. And, um, you know, there's, there's this story that's come to light because Marcus survived. And Marcus feels like he survived in order to tell the story. On June 28, 2005, Petty Officer Marcus Luttrell, a sniper and team medic, wasn't sure he was going to survive. He was badly wounded and didn't know anyone was trying to rescue him. My back was broke. I had a frag laying everywhere. I just crawled into this rock embankment, started taking dirt, putting it in all my wounds so I wouldn't bleed to death. So you had no, no medical gear? Uh, Did you have a map? It was all gone. Did you have a compass? Gone. Did you have... I didn't have pants on. You had no pants? And it was completely ripped off of me. Luttrell had been fighting for hours. His three SEAL brothers were all dead or near death. Petty Officer Danny Deeds from Littleton, Colorado, had been in charge of communications. Matt Axelson, AXE for short, was from Cupertino, California. Like Luttrell, he was a petty officer and a sniper. Lieutenant Mike Murphy was the team leader. They were part of a larger mission called Operation Red Wings. Their job was to locate this man, whom the four SEALs had only seen in grainy photographs. He was an elusive militia leader aligned with the Taliban named Ahmed Shah. Who was Ahmed Shah? He had a group that he ran called the Mountain Tigers. He, uh, he was creating all kinds of havoc out there in that particular region that he was in, killing Marines, Army, I mean, you, you name it. Luttrell was based at Bagram Air Base outside Kabul and says his team had no idea exactly how many fighters Ahmed Shah had with him. So I remember telling the guys, you know, grab some extra rounds, we may need them. It was pitch black when Marcus Luttrell, Danny Dietz, Matt Axelson, and the team leader Mike Murphy were dropped by chopper a couple miles from where Ahmed Shah was believed to be located. Luttrell says they hiked for hours through snowy, steep, and treacherous terrain. As daylight came, the four seals lay down and concealed themselves in the mountainside so they wouldn't be detected. That's when everything went wrong. Suddenly, they were surprised, not by gunmen, but by a goat herder. I was laying next to a tree, probably 60 feet long. He had come walking down it, and when he jumped off of it, he jumped right off of it, right over the top of my gun. He didn't see you at all? He had no idea I was there. And I had no idea he was above me. Did he say anything? Nothing, not one word. Just a look. That's all, that's all he would do is just look at us. And, and I know that sounds funny, but there's a way some, somebody's going to look at you when you cut them off in traffic or something like that, and they're mad at you or whatnot. And then there's a way someone's going to look at you when they want to kill you. And when it happens to you, you'll never forget it. Two more herders showed up along with about 70 goats. The SEAL's mission was compromised. You hear the, the, the bells jingling, and then they just come up over every side of it. Goats. Goats, yeah. Danny Deeds tried to call back to base for instructions, but couldn't get through on their radio. The team had to decide on their own what to do with the goat herders. Run through the options that you, that you talked about. Talked about zip-tying them, zip-tying the goats. Zip-tying them, taking them with us, or zip-tying them and leaving them. Zip-tying the goats, and zip, or just executing the goats. Talked about zip-tying and eliminating the threat, the human threat. You talked about killing them? Yes. And then the last one was turn them loose. U.S. military personnel are required to operate under formal rules of engagement that specify when deadly force can be used. A commander has the authority and obligation to use all necessary means available, the rules say, to defend his unit from a hostile act or demonstration of hostile intent. But the goat herders who'd surprised the team were unarmed. We knew that they hated us and that they, they weren't on our side. Right. And if they had the chance, that they would like to see us dead. That's the feeling we were getting. And you had every reason to believe, if you let these guys go, they're going to run down the mountain and tell... Right, but you can't justify that feeling to our superiors in a court of law. The SEALs knew that other U.S. military personnel had been court-martialed and imprisoned for violating the rules of engagement. So you were concerned that... If you kill them, you would be charged with murder. Yes, absolutely. That's something you talked about then? Absolutely. 
killing them was really not an option because they were uh, non-combatants and they were unarmed. Retired Vice Admiral Joe McGuire says the only options the SEALs really had were to take the goat herders captive and try to get evacuated by helicopter or let them go. You don't shoot innocent people. You don't shoot unarmed people unless, of course, they pose a threat. Even if those goat herders are going to run down to the village and compromise your location. That's correct. You know, you don't you don't kill innocent people. Luttrell told us the unit discussed what to do and were divided. In the past, he's been criticized for saying they took a vote, something that's not supposed to happen in SEAL teams because it's up to the team leader to make a decision. What did Mike finally decide to do? I would cut him loose. What was the feeling you had when you let him go? I got that sinking feeling in my stomach. I'm like, this is, this is bad. Everybody did. A couple times you said, looking back on it, you wished you had made a different decision. You wished you'd killed them. Do you still believe that? Sure. Got my friends back. I mean, who knows what the outcome would have been. I'm, you can't. <clears throat> yes, I wish I would have, is the answer to your question. Luttrell says it was only about an hour after they freed the goat herders that the first enemy fighters appeared. They were on a ridge on this mountainside above where the seals had dug in. I mean, we had to break out our shovels and use our boots and actually build these little shelves to stand in. And when we were done, we'd lean back against the mountain like this. The first guy I saw had an RPG over each shoulder and an AK-47. And then there was about 30 or 40 guys in line with him. Had they seen you? Not, not yet. And my rifle was right here. I just cradled it and I rolled my head up like this. I shot him in the head. The, the game was on right then. According to Luttrell, Ahmed Shah's forces moved in to outflank the SEALs. We obtained this video, recorded by enemy forces, from an American writer and photographer with military sources. The date stamp and other scenes that are too gruesome to show you indicate it was recorded the day of the fighting. This is how the firefight is portrayed in a new film called Lone Survivor, which opens later this month. It's based on a book Marcus Luttrell wrote. It's a Hollywood movie, not a documentary. But Luttrell and other former SEALs consulted on the film, and Luttrell says it captures the intensity of the battle. The enemy fire was continuous, AK-47s, rocket-propelled grenades. Luttrell says when the round started coming in from both sides, it broke the SEALs' position. And that shelf that I had made crumbled and fell apart and just, it was like somebody opened up a trap door underneath me, I just fell. And I started tumbling, and then I hit Mikey and I busted him right off of his little perch he was on. We both started pinballing in those trees. You're basically tumbling down the mountain. Yes, sir. Yeah. I landed on my back and broke my back and Mikey landed on his face and crushed his face. The trail says the four SEALs continued to fire on the advancing fighters, but repeatedly fell or were forced to jump down the mountain. Every time you fell, you broke something. I mean, by an hour and a half into this, Danny's been shot three times that I know of. I was dragging him, set him up. He'd, we'd fight for a little while, we'd get shot out of there, I'd drag him somewhere else. Even after Danny was shot multiple times and you're dragging him, he was still firing? Yes, sir, as best he could. We got to an area where I, I was telling him there was another way we could fall. And when I put my arms underneath him, I put him underneath his shoulders. When I spun him around to take the fall, uh, I spun him into a bullet and it hit him in the back of the head and uh, killed him. Danny Dietz was the first SEAL to die. Now it was just Latrell, Matt Axelson, and Mike Murphy left alive. I caught up with uh, Mikey and he asked me where Danny was and I was like, he's dead. Well, we tried to go get him. But once you fell a certain distance, you couldn't get back up the way you came. It was too steep. It just wasn't working. What happened then? Axe walked out from behind the rock I was firing on, almost shot him. He sat down Indian style against my left hip and leaned against my right leg. He goes, I'm sorry, bro, I can't help you. He goes, I'm blind. He goes, they shot me in the face. Luttrell says the SEALs were surrounded. They hadn't gotten through on the radio, so he says Lieutenant Mike Murphy decided to move to a completely exposed position so he could get a signal on his satellite phone and call for backup. Mikey was out and pushed out onto this, um, this boulder out in the middle of the draw and this wide open, no cover, no nothing. He was on our satellite phone. Luttrell saw his lieutenant make the call. 
a call Mike Murphy knew would likely cost him his life. He took two rounds to the chest because he, he spun like a top and it dropped him. And I, I tried to wait. I made my way up to him. You know, he's my best friend. And I, I'd already lost Danny. And I knew that Axe was dying. I didn't want to lose him. And then he started to crawl left. And I was out in the open, waving my hands. I was like, just come down to me. That's all I wanted him to do was just come down to me. And uh, I heard his gun go off and a lot of gunfire in his area. I was trying with everything I had to get to him. And he, uh, he started screaming my name. He was like, Marcus, man, you got to help me. I need help, Marcus. That it got so intense that I actually put my weapon down and covered my ears because I couldn't stand to hear him die. All I wanted him to do was stop screaming my name. And uh, they killed him. And I, I, and, I, and I put my weapon down in a gunfight while my best friend was getting killed. So that pretty much makes me a coward. How can he say that? Say what? Why, why, do you, why do you think that? Why do I think what? That putting your weapon down makes you a coward. Because that is a cowardice act, if you put your weapon down in a gunfight. You know, they, they, they say every man has his breaking point. I never thought I'd find mine. The only way you break a Navy SEAL is you have to kill us. But I broke right there. I quit right there. I don't know. Still, Marcus Luttrell says he managed to pick up his weapon and found Matt Axelson, the only other SEAL left alive. He was below me. And he had crawled underneath this rock overhang. And I crawled in there. I was looking. I was like, we're going to die, man. We're going to die right now. You said that to Axe? Mm hmm And I, you know, I made my peace with God a long time ago about dying. But most of the time, we don't know when we're going to die. They just shut our light off. And uh, it's a weird feeling when you know the Reaper's at the door. Matt Axelson was badly wounded, but Latrell, the team medic, said there was nothing he could do. And an RPG hit behind him and blew him on top of me. I just remember how, how loud it was and how wide it went. And then when I pushed him off of me, uh, another one hit and blew us out of there. Blew him one way, blew me another. I never saw him again for the rest of my life. Marcus Luttrell says he isn't sure how many hours they'd been fighting. But as darkness fell, he was all alone. How'd you get through that night? It was rough. That was the longest night of my life because the sun had gone down. It was dark. It was pitch black. I was, I'd, you know, I'd fall and knock myself out. I'd come to. I'd keep crawling. And I just, that's what I just kept doing. The next day, he was desperate. Still pursued by enemy fighters, he'd been shot twice in his legs. He had three cracked vertebrae and was bleeding profusely. But he says his biggest concern was finding water to drink. People wouldn't consider thirst as being a big deal. But it, it, could, it becomes all you can think about after a while. That's it. It was, it was the only thing I could concentrate on. It was the only thing I could think about. Not, not even my wounds. Any, all the wounds I had sustained, my back, broken back, all that, nothing. All I cared about was the thirst. That was it. I mean, I was willing to, to kill anybody or anything or do whatever I had to do to get water. He says when he finally found water, he didn't get to drink for long. He was suddenly surrounded by a small group of Afghan men. And I found a waterfall. And I managed to get to the top of it, took my gloves off, washed my face. I leaned into the water fountain and got two sips out of it before some guy was screaming at me again and two guys with guns were maneuvering around on me. I had my gun at my hip, tension out of my trigger, my safety was off. You had a grenade, too? Uh-huh. When he was walking towards me, I pulled it, and I pulled the pin out, and I said, you know, if you try anything, I'll kill all of us. I don't care. I'm, I've had enough. It was the second time in the mission Marcus Luttrell had to decide. Were the men in front of him civilians or enemy fighters? Luttrell also didn't know that an American rescue operation had already been mounted and had gone terribly wrong both those stories when we come back. Some 36 hours after his four-man Navy SEAL team was dropped into enemy territory in the mountains of northeastern Afghanistan, Marcus Luttrell says he was all alone. He didn't know that Special Operations Forces had attempted a rescue operation, but that mission had ended in tragedy when one of the choppers was blown up with 16 people on board. Luttrell was badly wounded. He'd been shot twice, several vertebrae were cracked, and he had shrapnel wounds in his legs. At least two of his SEAL teammates were dead. The third had been shot multiple times and was missing. Desperately thirsty, pursued by enemy fighters, Marcus Luttrell says he had just found some water to drink 
when he was surprised by several Afghan men who he had first thought were members of the Taliban. The story will continue in a moment. When I got to that waterfall and got those two sips out of there, I was actually looking around thinking, you know, this is a pretty good place to lay down and die. You were ready to die. I wasn't ready to die. I, I just knew I was dying. That's when an Afghan man appeared. Latrell later learned his name was Muhammad Gulab. He came up over this rock ledge and started screaming at me, American, American. And I swung around on him. I mean, I had my finger on the trigger, tension out of safety off. And he started walking at me, and he was like, okay, okay. And he lifted up his shirt to show me that he didn't have a weapon. And he was like, okay, okay, okay. I lowered my weapon, and I, I pulled a grenade and pulled a pin, and I was saying, you know, I'll, I'll kill all of us. You were prepared to blow yourself up along with everybody else? Yes. I wasn't, I wasn't going to get taken. Why do you think you didn't kill him? I can't tell you. I don't know why. Luckily for Latrell, Mohammed Gulab, who lived in a nearby village, was not a member of the Taliban. He gave me water, and then he rolled me over, and he had seen where I'd been shot, and I was bleeding real bad. Three other guys plus him picked me up and started carrying me down to their village. SEAL commanders didn't know what had happened to Marcus Latrell and his three teammates. Petty Officer Danny Dietz was dead. Petty Officer Matt Axelson had been gravely wounded and was separated from Latrell. Lieutenant Mike Murphy had been killed after making a satellite phone call for help. Retired Vice Admiral Joe McGuire told us how much he admires Murphy for making that call. They're in a life and death situation. He's been shot. Matt's been shot. Danny's been shot. He finished the call, and at the end, you know, he said, we can really use your help. He said, well, help is on the way. Mike finished the call with, thank you. Even though, I mean... Thank you. Yeah. You know, he went out there, and he gave above and beyond to do that. Now, and he knew going out on that rock. He probably wouldn't man. have come back. As a result of the call, two Chinook helicopters like these with Special Operations Forces on board raced to the mountainside where the four SEALs had been fighting. The Chinooks went in without the Apache gunships that usually provide cover. It was the pilots and the task unit commander that made a conscious decision that, okay, we're going to press and we're going to get there because we have to make a difference. To me, when people ask, what would you say would be, would sum up, you know, the greatest mistake uh, in military operations, to me, it's just simple two words, too late. As portrayed in the new movie Lone Survivor, one of the Chinooks was hovering to offload special forces. That's when a rocket-propelled grenade was fired into it. All special operations forces on board, eight SEALs and eight Army Night Stalkers were killed. It hit hard, and um, you know, we lost all souls on board. Marcus Luttrell likely wouldn't have made it if it weren't for Mohammed Gulab. He ended up in his village for four days, being moved between different houses and even a cave to prevent him from being captured. He was finally rescued by U.S. forces who had been scouring the mountains. They'd been looking for you. Right, for as long as I'd been missing. So they were beat to hell. What was that feeling when you saw the the first American in the village? Well, I was, I was out of it pretty hard. I mean, I, my head was down there carrying me. I just remember I lifted my head up barely because he was screaming my name. He's like, Marcus, is that you? And I was like, yeah, right here, bro. Marcus Luttrell, the lone survivor, was finally going home. But returning to regular life in America hasn't been easy. I mean, you've spent time with Marcus. What was it like for him coming home? Rough, very rough. Go, action. Pete Berg, who directed the movie Lone Survivor, first met Luttrell after he read his book. Berg was shocked by Luttrell's condition when he went to visit him in his house in Texas. I went in there and it was, it was almost like living in a shrine. Um, it was nothing but pictures of his, his dead brothers and flags and, and helmets and mementos and pieces of uniform from his dead brothers. And on the, in the middle of the living room floor was a, basically a tombstone with the names of the, uh, all of his brothers that had died in that operation. And Marcus would, would sit in that house um, in, that, in that moment, in that experience, in that gunfight. He was almost living inside of it when I first met him. Marcus Luttrell has suffered both emotionally and physically, but his family and friends say he's getting better. He has a service dog, Mr. Rigby, who never leaves his side. He's also gotten married. He and his wife, Melanie, have two children. 
Luttrell has also had time to piece together what happened to him when he was badly wounded on the mountain in Afghanistan, including details of Gulab's role in saving his life. Now, eight years later, the two men have become close friends, and Gulab occasionally flies from Afghanistan to Luttrell's family's ranch in Texas to visit. I love you. Oh. We did. He says, I, I love you too. He said, that's why I'm here. I came for you, he says, my brother. We wanted to know why Gulab was willing to risk his life to help a complete stranger. He told us it was because of a tribal code of honor called Pashtunwali. Explain Pashtunwali. Pashtunwali is a respect, a respect for a guest that comes knocking at your door. And even if he is in need or if he is in imminent danger, we must protect him. I knew I had to help him, to do the right thing, because he was in a lot of danger. You knew that they would come for him? They did. The Taliban came and sat down with me. I said, no, I will not hand him over to you. What did they threaten? They told me, you will die, your brother will die, your cousins will die, your whole family will die. It's not worth it. Give us the American. And I said, no, I will protect him till the end. Gulab has suffered for protecting Luttrell. He says his house was burned down and a cousin killed. In Afghanistan, he's had to go into hiding with his wife and 10 children. Is that you? The trail is hoping to get him a green card so he can settle at least part-time in the United States. I mean, we're, we're family. We're, you consider him family? Absolutely. I mean, we're, bro we're brothers in blood. We bled together. He very well could have just left me laying there on the side of that waterfall and let me die, but he didn't. For his bravery, Marcus Luttrell was awarded the Navy Cross in a White House ceremony. Matt Axelson and Danny Deeds were also awarded the Navy Cross posthumously. For sacrificing his life to make that telephone call, Lieutenant Mike Murphy was given the Medal of Honor. His parents accepted it. It was the first time the country's highest military honor was awarded for service in Afghanistan. Ahmed Shah, the man Murphy's team was looking for, was killed in a separate operation in 2008. After retiring, Vice Admiral Joe McGuire runs the Special Operations Warrior Foundation, which provides support for veterans and their families. Marcus Luttrell created and raises money for a similar group, the Lone Survivor Foundation. Luttrell has also visited families of his fallen SEAL brothers. You traveled around the country to do that? Yes, sir. What was that like? That sucked. Think about it like this. All right, if you had a son that was out on that mountain with me, if one guy had to live, who would you pray for? Your son or for would you pray for me? And every time they look at me, I'm, I'm the one who made it out and delivered the news of how hard their son fought, but I'm also the one who lived and their son died. Why? Why did you live and why did my son die? I don't have the answer to that.